Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sirian Villavicencio, and I am a gubernatorial appointee. I currently serve as a commissioner and former chair of the California Commission on Asian and Pacific Islander American Affairs. I'll give my fellow moderators an opportunity to introduce themselves. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Papa. Uh, my name is Roy Kaufman. First, I have to perform to give respect to my boss, the Honorable Dr. Shirley Weber of the California Assembly. I'm also current president of the Black American Political Association of California Sacramento chapter. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michael Chad, and I am the Community Affairs Director for the Asia Pacific Islander Capital Association, otherwise known as a BFIP. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. I want to thank our candidates for participating in, in this panel. I will go over the process for this panel. Each candidate will have two minutes to provide opening statements. We ask that our candidates focus on their policy platforms and not on their opponents. After the opening statements, our moderators will ask uh, you, we will ask you policy questions. And each candidate will have uh, two minutes to respond to their opening statements. We will then ask you questions. Um, uh, maybe three to four questions depending on time. Each candidate will have an opportunity to provide a uh, one uh, minute closing statement. For each question, you will have one minute to respond each. Okay? Uh, and so with that uh, said, let's go ahead and get started. For opening statements, we've determined this randomly uh, beforehand. And uh, uh, Controller Betty Yee, Ms. Yee, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here at the Apava Candidate Forum, and uh, also want to uh, welcome uh, Mr. Reditas to Sacramento. This is our first time meeting in person, so it's really an honor to uh, be together on the stage. Uh, I know that uh, really when we are campaigning, uh, the $64 million question is, what does the state controller do? And uh, the controller has uh, the primary responsibility of being the independent fiscal watchdog for the state of California. Uh, to be sure that uh, we are monitoring the state's finances. We're the only independent auditor for the state of California, independent of the legislature, independent of the governor, and uh, also responsible for payroll for over 250,000 state employees and California State University employees, as well as uh, managing the cash, monitoring the revenues coming into the state, paying the bills for the state of California, and also preparing all the financial reports and the financial statements for the state of California uh, for those who are interested in the financial condition for the state. And what I just want to say is it's, it's, it's really been a privilege to serve in this office. Of all of the statewide constitutional offices, I believe that this one, because of its focus on uh, fiscal and financial transparency and accountability, has the most potential of elevating the public's trust and confidence in their government. And I believe we've demonstrated that in my first term as controller. To be able to have my audit team uncover $4 billion in, in unallowed uses of public funds to where we're able to put those dollars either back in the general fund or direct them to their appropriate programs. Uh, to be able to look at uh, having the state in sound financial condition where our financial reports have received awards for their integrity and transparency. And more importantly, uh, to be sure that every day we're focused on how to prepare for the inevitable downturn that the state will face in uh, all likelihood around 2020 uh, because we are well into the 10th year of recovery after the Great Recession. And so I just want to applaud the team that are the professionals that make up the State Controller's Office that really are the watchdogs for all of us, for the state of California, to be sure that we are on sound fiscal footing. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Ms. Yee. Mr. Rodriguez, this time is yours. Thank you. My name is Konstantinos Rodriguez. I know a lot of people are going to have some trouble with that. So afterwards, just go to my website, cacontroller.com, so you can learn more about me. But why am I running for controller? I believe the controller is the chief financial officer of the state, but more importantly, the chief taxpayer watchdog. The controller is an elected position, not an appointed, because a lot of those functions that the controller's office does is very important. But why is it an elected position? It is an elected position it's because it needs to be the chief taxpayer watchdog to watch out for that waste, rot, and abuse that's going on, to watch out for the taxpayers. In California, we have you know, the highest poverty rate. One in five Californians live in poverty. 47% consider themselves working poor. Our taxes keep going up, our budget keeps on going up, and California is harder and harder to, to live in. People just don't know what to do. They're feeling frustrated by their, by their government. And I think it's time for the controller's office to really start taking a look at and say, how can we make life more affordable for Californians? 
when we took a look at projects like the high speed rail, when we see waste fraud and abuse that is rampant, why are we continuing down this path? We're, we're looking at constant new threats of new taxes and new spending. We need somebody who's going to protect the taxpayers. And that's why I'm running for controller, to try and make life a little bit better for every single Californian here. And when those inevitable recessions come, it's not how are we going to raise taxes, but how are we going to create a system and give that advice to the governor and the legislature to say we can do better in California. And that's why I'm running for California State Controller. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. Now, I wanted to clarify, uh, I think I made a mistake about the answers to the questions. You will have two minutes to respond to each question. And so with that said, I'm going to uh, hand it over to my colleague here for the first question. Thank you. So both of you first, congratulations on visiting. The first question is going to be a little different than to do CalPERS. Um, my concern is that we did a um, study with CalPERS a couple of years ago, and thanks to uh, Reverend Al Sharpton, we had a national conference about it, also hand speed. The Palace Perth Board doesn't reflect the California. I would hope that you both of you would look at it and see how we could improve the representation of California on that board to look like California. 95% of the members of CalPERS is of European background, it's a nice way for English, and nobody who looks like me sits on that board. So the question is, and because it's so important and the largest, if you will, in the United States, how could you help change that in terms of appointment process? Uh, Mr. Rodriguez. Well, the one thing that I know about money, if you guys open up your wallets, your dollar's going to look exactly like mine. So the number one thing to actually do in CalPERS is protecting state workers uh, because we're in a pension crisis. We're talking about having a discount rate of 7.5 and we're migrating it slowly to about uh, 7%, which is also very unrealistic. Our own uh, analysts and ex outside experts are saying the rate of return should be at 6.2%. Uh, Stanford uh, Institute of Economic Policy Research did a study that said it should be around 5.5%. So what is that telling us? If we're looking at that from CalPERS, CalSERS, and the UC, if we're taking Stanford's numbers, we're probably looking around $900 billion of unfunded pension liabilities. We need to get serious about what the condition is of our pensions, get the right people in there, and be realistic. If we drop the discount rate too fast, I get it, we're going to have problems with uh, cities and municipalities uh, going bankrupt. Uh, so we just need to take a look at those uh, and get the right numbers in there before uh, employees don't have their pensions. Thank you. Uh, in answer to the question about representation on CalPERS, uh, the board composition is driven by uh, statutory requirements and uh, many of the membership is uh, elected by uh, various constituencies of the public sector workforce. Uh, the remainder of the uh, members are uh, either the constitutional officers of the state controller, the state treasurer, and the remaining appointments are the gubernatorial appointments. And uh, I think with a new gubernatorial administration coming in, we certainly ought to be making our case that we want to see diversity on this board because our public sector workforce and educators is a diverse workforce. Uh, I do want to say that the uh, board has done everything uh, possible to try to strengthen uh, the stability of the fund with risk mitigation strategies, uh, with looking at reducing the discount rate, as Mr. Rodinas has mentioned, uh, but we don't want to bankrupt local governments in the process. So it really is a balance, but where I'm really focused are on the investment returns. We know that companies are, are really receiving a lot of uh, windfalls and, and profits and not necessarily putting it back into the company to create long-term value, which then will generate the returns that we need to pay the benefits for our, our beneficiaries and members. And so it's really a multi-pronged process, and I believe this board has been doing its job. As a newly minted state employee, this is an issue that is uh, very important to uh, a lot of us. Uh, this question is going to be about unfunded pension liabilities. Um, California's public employee pension systems are facing gaps, also called unfunded liabilities, as you might know. And public investment firms such as CalPERS are responding by ramping up mandatory contributions with public agencies. Uh, this has brought some institutions such as school districts and cities to the brink of insolvency and requiring a slash of public services such as police and fire. As a sitting member of various pension funds, how would you help addressing the so-called pension crisis? And uh, this if you would like to address first. 
Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so this is a uh, looming crisis, but I will say that uh, when we look at CalPERS and certainly the impact of these liabilities on our members, I think we have to remember that CalPERS is not alone in this situation. Every pension fund is facing a crisis with respect to unfunded liabilities. The bulk of our unfunded liability at CalPERS relates to retiree health care. And uh, I'm glad to say that the governor, Governor Brown, has insisted that all 21 bargaining units of state employees now prepay uh, for retiree health care. And so that will help with the liability over time in terms of reducing that. Uh, with respect to the pension liability, I think what we need to look at, we don't set benefits at CalPERS. That we certainly uh, look at the uh, actuarials and certainly uh, the liabilities that confront the fund so that we know uh, what we need to assume with respect to our, our, our discount rate and our assumed rate of return on our investments. Uh, we obviously don't want to uh, continue to press employers for increasing their employer contributions nor employees, and I think what will need to happen, frankly, is that we're going to have to talk about uh, two things. One, how do we be sure that workers are uh, contributing all that they can to their retirement? It's a defined benefit plan, and uh, that happens at the bargaining table with each employer, both the state and both governments. And then secondly, we need to do a better job of looking at what it means to live in retirement and reducing those costs that are so costly for those who are in older adulthood and in retirement cost of housing, cost of transportation, cost of utilities. And obviously California is a high cost state and when we talk about affordability, it ought to be affordability for every spectrum of our uh, community uh, here in California. So it's not just a pension issue, it is a broader affordability issue and uh, the, we at CalPERS are very cognizant of the fact that when we look at the unfunded liability, uh, we're doing everything we can with respect to pressing on employers, employees, but more importantly, those investment returns that really have taken a hit and not recovered since the Great Recession. The number one thing that we need to do is be honest. We need to be honest with what the problem is, and we haven't been doing that. Our actuarial calculations, our rate of returns, our discount rates, do not reflect what's going on. And what the state does, trickles down to the city and to the county levels. When we passed SB 400, uh, which I believe was not a very smart move, and even uh, Gray Davis said if he had the chance over again, he would uh, veto that legislation. And what is happening is we're not being honest of what our problems are. If we are legitimately looking at around $900 billion in unfunded pension liabilities, and we're not giving correct actuarial calculations, when we're talking about the state that is having a budget surplus, well, that is inaccurate, that is a lack, and we should have been putting more money into the pension systems to shore it up. So unless we go ahead and get those numbers correct, and we're working off of false assumptions, there's no way we can fix it. No matter what, I'm in the business world. In the business world, you cannot fix a problem unless you fully know what the problem is, and we need to be honest with ourselves. What kind of services are unfortunately going to have to be cut. How are we going to have to structure tax codes a little bit different to go ahead and shore these up? How about we start moving away from these defined benefit plans and something better that's going to go ahead and reflect the 21st century economy and people switching jobs? These are discussions that we need to have. And unless we get down to the point and say, this is what is really going on, uh, we're just going to keep spinning our wheels and we're going to continue falling more and more into debt until we become honest with ourselves. Thank you. salient one given what's happening uh, today with current events. This year, the hashtag MeToo movement brought a light to a number of sexual abuse scandals that unfolded in Hollywood and even our California state capitol. Reported instances of dehumanizing sexual harassment behavior has forced lawmakers and high-profile legislative staff out of their office. Since then, a dozen of legislative efforts have been discussed to address workplace sexual harassment. But many argue that these measures don't address workplace cultures that discourage victims from reporting pervasive harassment. So, as an elected official, what would you do to address sexual harassment in your office? How would you create a safe workplace environment for those working for you? And how would you keep your colleagues accountable? Mr. Rodriguez. We need to respect each other. That's what we need to do. We need to respect each other. There's always going to be issues into the in the workplace. You, 
you're not going to be able to have a perfect perfect system. I think the number one thing is to take a look at is uh, when somebody steps out of line, we shouldn't be hiding the fact of, of payouts. Um, you know, I, I don't know, I would like to, I mean, this is not an attack or whatever, I would just like to kind of know why, you know, we're paying out these victims or we're trying to hide when legislatures, you know, how are we, you know, cashing out these checks, why is it out to the public? Uh, I think, you know, are we protecting people who shouldn't be protected or politicians who, you know, because they align with our political system or our political party that we're gonna kind of turn a blind eye. Uh, it's just not acceptable whatsoever to uh, have that situation and anybody in my office uh, that would do that one will, uh, I'll fire them right on the spot, I don't care. Uh, they don't, you know, you treat people with disrespect. Uh, you, you, you have no place in the government. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I can just say, first of all, um, I want to just applaud the many courageous voices that have been part of the Me Too movement uh, that really has galvanized this movement across this country. And I think certainly what we witnessed over this past week uh, was really a culmination of um, just supporting one another to be able to speak uh, truths about uh, instances of harassment. Uh, I will say that uh, this year we've been very active, but uh, one of the things I just want to say is, yes, the spotlight has been on the legislature, certainly in our political field, in Hollywood, uh, in tech, with respect to where sexual harassment has occurred, but frankly, it occurs throughout our economy. And we think about the service sectors where we have our hotel workers, and it certainly happens in the agricultural fields. It happens uh, you know, with janitors who work in office buildings at night. It is pervasive. It is pervasive. And so I was very proud to be uh, the sponsor of a piece of legislation still pending before the governor, Senate Bill 1343 by Senator Holly Mitchell, which puts the state in the position of being able to uh, provide educational tools, basic education, so that all employers are now required uh, to provide sexual harassment training to their employees in the private sector, of uh, five employees or more, and it's the Department of Fair Employment and Housing that will be responsible for having the tools to help victims identify what constitutes sexual harassment, how to report it, and what are the resources available for them to pursue any action. Uh, secondly, uh, I just want to say that um, with respect to uh, what we do in our office, uh, and frankly what we can all do is that if we see any instances of this, we have to call it out. We have to call it out. We have to be each other's eyes and ears and be supportive of one another in the workplace. And, uh, because when I speak to those who have been working in the agricultural fields, who have been janitors at home, uh, at, at, at uh, office buildings and uh, who've worked in the hotels and who are, have been victims of sexual harassment, they have said to me, we thought government was there to help us. We thought government was there to help us. Where do they go? And oftentimes these go unreported as we know, and so the numbers that we see don't even reflect what I think is really happening out there. So I'm hopeful that Governor Brown will sign uh, Senate Bill 1343. I'm also hopeful that uh, now with the culture of having heard the courageous voices step up, that we all can lend our voice to those who have been wrong and who face injustice and that we can support them as well. Thank you. I want to thank both of our candidates. We are out of time for questions, which now leads us to closing statements. You will have one minute. Uh, two minutes? Two minutes for closing statements. Thank you for the correction. Pardon me. Two minutes for closing statements, and we will start with Mr. Prodigious. Well, I just want to thank uh, Controller Yi for coming out here today. A lot of the other candidates who are here won't be speaking with their opponent, and uh, she deserves a round of applause for her. It means a lot for her to, to respect you as voters to come out here, so thank you again. Um, what makes, what's the difference between us two? I think we're, we're both very capable to do the job. It's what's the vision of what the controller's office will look like. And I believe it should be a tool for making life better for everyday Californians and saying we can do better. Uh, when we have the highest, one of the highest uh, cost of living in America, we can do better. When we have some of the highest taxes, we can do better. When we have 61% of increase in our budget over the last eight years, and then we say we don't have any money, but we need to come back and say we need to raise the car and gas tax because we don't have enough money. These are problems and issues that we are facing here in California. And we 
need somebody who's going to be that independent mind. I don't care if it's Democrat, I don't care if it's Republican, or if it's bipartisan. If it's filled with waste, fraud, and abuse that doesn't comply with the law, I'll use the authority of the office granted to me to go ahead and, and root those issues out. And one of the things that I want to make sure that everybody knows that there is no conflict of interest of me, that I have refused to take any PAC, union, lobbyist, big business, corporation, or special interest money. My campaign is 100% funded by the grassroots, and I believe, especially with the controller's office, there has to be no inkling of conflict of interest, and that's why I'm running for controller, is to actually have a controller there for the people. And I thank you once again for coming out here. We really appreciate it. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Medidas, for being here. It's a pleasure to meet you in person, finally. Uh, I just want to say uh, it's been a privilege to serve as your uh, Chief Fiscal Officer over the last four years. And it is uh, one, as uh, Mr. Adidas says, it's an office that really can lend some vision to the direction of the state. And we are the world's fifth largest economy, and unfortunately we are home to the highest, rate of effect highest effective rate of poverty among the 50 states. And this is just unacceptable. And so when uh, many people ask me, because uh, not only do I carry out the duties that I described earlier, but I also, by virtue of the office, have a seat on about 70 different boards and commissions. You've heard about public pensions, but I also serve as a chair of the Franchise Tax Board. I'm a member of the Board of Equalization. I chair the State Lands Commission, and also am on the board of CalSavers, which is to establish a state-sponsored retirement savings program for the 7 million private sector workers who don't have a retirement savings plan through their employer. But I say all this because this office can lend a vision with respect to the future of this state. Often I get asked, what keeps me up at night with respect to doing this job? And I will have to say that uh, there will come a time when um, I may run out of money to pay the bills for the state of California. And not because of any wrongdoing, but because we do have an inefficient tax system. And because, frankly, we have two disruptors that are facing us today that are going to crowd out funding for essential public services if we don't get out ahead of uh, what these two disruptors mean. One is the future of work, when we see that uh, work is now becoming uh, more and more prominent in the gig economy, where the traditional employer-employer relationship will begin to be a blur. We need to start asking ourselves, what does that mean for workers? What does that mean for jobs that are going to be created in the future? What does that mean for economic opportunities? Does that mean automation is going to replace all of our jobs? Can we reimagine what work is going to look like? And reallocate work so that everyone throughout every corner of the state has a shot at new economic opportunity. And the second disruptor we're already facing is climate change. Uh, the wildfires that we have been seeing this past year is anything uh, but devastating. It is already demanding much more of our resources, our, our budgetary resources. And so we have to get out ahead of those two things, but from those two risks come tremendous opportunities. And with marrying those two and having a conversation about what this means for California, we can lead not just as being the home of uh, technological innovation, which we're really renowned for throughout the world, we have to talk about how we're going to develop our human resources, which is the driver of this economy here in California. And so let us be now going forward, working together, as being the home of human innovation, where we can talk about truly economic opportunity for all in every corner of this great state of California. Thank you so much for the invitation. On behalf, on behalf of the Papa, we want to thank Mr. Rodatis and Ms. Yee for being here with us and taking the time with us. Another round of applause for our <laughs>